Hi, this is Julian from AWS. Welcome to episode 11 of my podcast. This episode is an XJBoost special. Uh, as you probably know, XJBoost 1.0 came out just a few days ago, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to show you the different ways in which you can train and deploy XJBoost models on SageMaker. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel for future videos and let's dive into XJBoost. Let's take a look at the new features in XJBoost 1.0. Uh, the first one is better performance scaling on multi-core CPUs and they claim up to 5x speed up on Intel CPUs with many cores. So that's pretty good because on AWS, you can definitely use Intel CPUs with many cores. You have quite a choice of, uh, of training instances. So whether you run XJBoost on EC2 directly or whether you run it on, uh, on a managed service like SageMaker, that should make a difference. So um, surely something worth uh, benchmarking pretty soon. Well, the next one is, uh, is good news for me and uh, everybody using Mac OS. Um, it's now easier to install XJBoost on macOS, and that's not a tiny thing. And there's also distributed XJBoost on Kubernetes, if that's your thing. Uh, they have a tutorial for it, so probably you want to check that out as well. It would be interesting to try and run this on uh, EKS and, and see what happens. Maybe I can add this on my to-do list. Uh, Ruby bindings for XJBoost, for Ruby developers. Uh, a Dask interface. So Dask is a very, very cool framework for distributed computing. And uh, and so now XJBoost can natively use it with multiple GPUs. So that's pretty interesting. Dask is one of those things that uh, you keep hearing more and more about. So again, something for the to-do list. First class support for uh, QDF data frames and CoopI arrays. So again, more integration. Uh, of XJBoost with NVIDIA GPUs, which seems to be a very, very strong theme in XJBoost 1.0. And that's kind of interesting because uh, most customers I meet actually run XJBoost on CPU and they're quite happy with it. But I guess as they train on larger and larger data sets, um, the appeal of GPUs um, becomes more and more important. So it's good to see that XJBoost is uh, supporting uh, and integrating more with GPUs. Again, something worth testing. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, ranking on GPU, external memory for GPU training. So that's interesting. Again, uh, if you have, if your data set is bigger that, than what your um, GPU can accommodate, then XJBoost can, uh, can manage that. It used to be able to do that on CPU. You could actually train on, uh, on larger than memory um, uh, data sets, but looks like it can do that on GPUs as well. Improvement to the scikit-learn interface, good news as well. Um, lots of stuff on XJBoost 4J Spark, if that's your thing. And I guess the last one I want to mention is, uh, and I'll talk about that again when we look at uh, the examples, they're experimenting with a new uh, format to save models. So I guess, you know, most of us have been uh, using Pickle <laughs> to, uh, to serialize uh, XJBoost models uh, in Python. But um, this creates a, a bunch of problems, apparently, and, and they're moving from, from this format to, uh, to a more open and more portable, I guess, format, which is JSON-based. Um, and they have new APIs for that. Again, I'll point you, I'll point you to, uh, to that. Um, but it looks like if you have pickle models, um, you will have to retrain them and save them using the new format. Um, it looks like loading pickle models in XJBoost 1.0 and, and later is, uh, is something that can be a problem. So uh, it looks like we have to retrain. Okay, and then, uh, yeah, more things bug fixes, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is really, really a major release, right? Lots of GPU improvements um, and, um, and lots of scaling improvements as well. So that's pretty good. And yeah, there's already a 101 patch release. Uh, looks like they, there was a tiny thing that made it uh, past validation in 100, uh, 100. Okay, anyway. Okay, uh, so 
Now let's look at how we can run XJBoost on uh, SageMaker. Okay. The first way to run XJBoost on, on SageMaker is to use it as a built-in algo. And this was the original way. Uh, as you know, SageMaker has a collection of built-in algos. XJBoost is one of them. And what this means is you have a, a built-in XJBoost container that you can use directly. Just set hyperparameters, define the location of data, and train. Okay? So I've, I guess you know, you've seen this before, um, but really quickly, this is how you would do it. Uh, and uh, basically you would just grab the container, right? This line here, grab the container for the XJBoost algo in your region, and then use the SageMaker estimator, which is the generic object to configure training jobs, pass it, the name of that container, and then set hyperparameters for for XGBoost. And again, the list of hyperparameters is pretty much the, the exact same list uh, that you would see in the XGBoost documentation. Okay, this isn't different. Um, and then you would just train. Okay, so um, very simple. Select the right container, set hyperparameters, and train. So that's the that's the first way. Um, you have to pay attention to a couple of things. Uh, first, you can actually select the XJBoost version that you want to use, right? And you can see it here in the dock. So when you grab the name of the image, of the container image, there's a parameter called repo version where you can select the actual version that you want, okay? So I would recommend, at, we're using this one, uh, 0.90-2, uh, that's the latest version at the time of recording. I'm hoping very soon we'll have 1.0 here. Um, and uh, you definitely want this one because it is the first one to support SageMaker debugger, you know, that nice service that lets you configure debug debugging rules and inspect your training jobs as they go. So if you use anything older than this, um, SageMaker debugger won't be available. And generally, you know, you want the latest version, right? Now, the so second way you can uh, use XJBoost on SageMaker is to use it as a built-in framework, similar to TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, MXNet, etc., etc. And uh, just like for those frameworks, the uh, container that we use here is open sourced, and you can find it on GitHub. I will put all those links in the video description as usual. And you can uh, grab this container, you can build it on your local machine, you can uh, run it on your local machine, you can customize it, etc., etc. Okay. So the way this works is extremely similar to uh, what we do with the other frameworks. So here we're using the XJBoost object from the SDK, passing a script, defining infrastructure requirements, setting hyperparameters, the framework version as well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so this is exactly the same, um, the same way as other frameworks. All right. Here's a simple XJBoost example where I am uh, training a classifier on my usual data set, the the direct marketing data set that I keep using everywhere, and um, I am using script mode. Okay, so. If you're not familiar with script mode, script mode is the way to interface existing framework code with StageMaker. And this is really, really simple. Uh, it, it's all about receiving uh, hyperparameters from the command line, receiving uh, environment variables that define the location of the training script, oh, receiving environment variables that define the location of the training set, the validation set, and where to save the model. And that's about it. So it is very simple. If you have existing XJBoost code, it's not a big deal to convert it to script mode. Okay? So what am I doing here? Well, importing XJBoost, obviously, arguments from the command line. So here I just passed a single hyperparameter max depth, but you can add all the hyperparameters that you want. Okay? It The only thing is they need to be uh, command line arguments. And then I grab those three environment variables that I mentioned. Okay, so training set, validation set, location, uh, where to save the model. Okay, so grab those. 
And then using the environment variables, I load the data set. So we, it's already split in training and validation. So I already have those two channels. And loading my data set really means reading a CSV file with pandas. The labels are just that yes, yes column. And the samples are the everything but the yes, yes column. Okay. I'm sure you've seen this data set before. I've used it in so many videos before. Okay, so loading the data set and then creating my XJBoost classifier. So I am building a classifier. So binary logistic is my objective. I'm using the array under curve metrics uh, metric because it's, uh, it's a good one for this data set. And I'm passing that max depth uh, hyperparameter. Again, I could set more and uh, I just want to keep it simple here. Then I train, score on the validation set, I print the area on the curve, and I save the model. Okay, and notice I am not uh, pickling the model here. Okay, I am using that uh, save model API that saves in, uh, uh, in the binary format. Okay, uh, that new JSON format is described at, uh, at this page here. Okay, we're going to take a look at that. Okay, so how do I use this uh, script? Well, I have a vanilla XGBoost script mode notebook here. And uh, what I'm doing is downloading the data set. Uh, I am one hot encoding, like I said, dropping the yes, no column, because I, I just need one label, not two. And uh, then I'm splitting the data set between training and validation, saving those two uh, fragments as CSV files, defining the location where to save the model. And then just like we've seen, I use this XJBoost estimator, passing my script. I can train locally for quick debugging. Uh, I set the framework version, okay, latest version available for now. And then I can see my model training. I see the AUC that I printed out. So, so once the model has been trained, I can deploy it uh, just using the deploy API. And uh, after a few minutes, I can, uh, I can predict with it. Okay, so here I'm extracting one sample from the validation set, and that's a data frame. Okay, so I need to convert it to CSV. I can print that, uh, that sample. And I can use the uh, invoke endpoint API from uh, Boto3 to send the payload as CSV to the model and then read the answer, which is the, of course the probability between zero and one for that sample. Okay, so I, I like to use the Boto3 API because most of the time um, you will invoke models that have been already deployed maybe days ago so uh, so you don't have access to the to that estimator object and you can't really call uh, xjboost uh, xjb estimator dot uh, predict on it um, you you can do that as well you could recreate the object and call uh, predict but generally i find this to be easier okay so um, so that's how you do it uh, here notice that i used uh, csv um, i think you could send uh, csv libsvm and uh, and probably protobuf. Uh, if you want to use something else, then you need to write uh, a function that will an input fn function that will convert the input uh, from the format that you send to uh, to the format that uh, XJBoost needs. So, for example, if you want to send numpy um, uh, numpy uh, arrays directly here, that's possible, but you need to write that input fn function, and I, I didn't do that, okay. Uh, one thing you have to write is the model fn function, okay. This is not provided by the container, so you need to do that, but that's uh, pretty basic in 99% of situations. Uh, just load the model that you saved, right? Remember, we saved the XJBoost model here uh, using the save model API, so I'm just using the load model API to, to load it again in model FN. Okay, so remember this one is mandatory. Okay, it will complain if you if you forget it anyway. Okay, um, 
while we're on the topic of loading and saving models, this is the bit I wanted to cover quickly. So this is the new JSON-based format for XJBoost models. There's quite a bit to read, um, and it's quite interesting, you know, why they they want to switch to this uh, representation for models, what it means, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So quite a bit of a uh, of stuff to read and what the one thing that uh, caught my eye is this uh, so if you want to load pickled models so typically if you have models coming from XJBoost uh, point uh, 90 which is what we have on SageMaker at the moment um, you can try loading the models with the new um, uh, with the new version of XJBoost but they're kind of clear that you know it could be problematic so in the XJBoost repo, they actually provide a script to try and convert pickle models to the new format, uh, but they advise you not to use it when stability is needed. So uh, give it a shot, but I, again, I think retraining is probably a better way. Okay? So I'll put those links as well in the description. And uh, just to close this uh, XJBoost special, uh, well, of course, you could use a completely custom container. Uh, and uh, last week, I showed you how to do this with uh, MLflow. Um, take a look at this if you haven't. It's, I think it's pretty cool. I trained a local model on my Mac and then used MLflow to deploy it using a, a, a custom container on SageMaker. And the good thing is MLflow actually built the container for you. So uh, it's a completely uh, hands-off operation here. Uh, or you could uh, build your own SageMaker container because you want to be sure what's in it and you have specific requirements and whatnot. And uh, well, we have a bunch of examples of, of that. And uh, and one way would be maybe to try and and uh, do this with uh, Scikit-Learn as well. Um, so bringing your own container is definitely an option if you like writing Docker files and, uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, not my cup of tea personally, but the, the option is here. And again, I'll reference some uh, some examples that show you how to do that. Okay, so these are really the three uh, the three options. Go with the built-in algo. Uh, if you don't want to write machine learning code, you just want to use off-the-shelf containers and uh, and just set hyperparameters. That's nice. Um, the downside is, uh, of course, if you need to do extra processing before or after the actual training um, or prediction then uh, you will have to do that stuff outside of that container okay um, and i guess in this case um, the second option is is interesting using the framework mode where you can bring your own code your own xtboost script just like i showed you um, you could have uh, pre-processing steps in there post-processing steps in there so you have more control over the code. And if you really want to build everything yourself, then uh, you know, bringing your own container is definitely possible. All right, I think that's uh, what I wanted to tell you uh, about XJBoost. Okay, that's it for episode 11. I hope you learned a few things. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to be notified of future videos. And until next time, keep rocking. Yeah.